Hi there, and welcome to Context Free, where we talk about programming languages. Today, I want to talk about type inference in a variety of settings, but the rabbit hole goes very deep, so we'll only see a small part of it. In my Hello World video, I surprised some people and or ruffled some feathers by using the var feature for local variable type inference. This feature was introduced in Java 10, and we're going to dig at it a little bit today. For most of the languages today, we're going to use this example here, where we have some kind of immutable list of strings, colors in this case. We can pretend they came from somewhere else in the program and we're not supposed to change them. Then we're going to copy them into a new list that is mutable. Then we'll just loop through and print them out along with their index for fun. And of course, this is a proxy for more interesting programs. So let's take a look at the type inference that's happening here. We say arrays.aslist red, yellow, blue. And aslist is a generic function that infers the type of the argument being passed in. And so we see that colors is known to be a list of string. We see colors2 is an array list of string, and index is an int. If we run this program, we get what we expect. Colors0 through 2 are red, yellow, blue. So one of the open questions is whether it makes your code better or worse to do type inference here. Would my code be clearer if I spelled out my types? Related to this issue is what types are being inferred. So for example, while generics were added overall in Java 5, and before that, we only had lists of objects. Java 7 introduced the ability to use a diamond operator, which here means that it infers the type arguments. And it works entirely on the expression being defined at the moment. So for example, now colors2 is an array of object. I would have to include something else to let it know that it's an array list of string. But really, perhaps I only want to interact with colors2 through the list interface. So what I could do instead here is give an explicit left-hand type. This was the preferred style starting with Java 7. So whatever my expression happens to be, I'm still going to be explicit about how I treat my variable. And then the question remains of whether full out local variable type inference is a good idea or not. And to some extent it matters, you know, how big are your functions and are you likely to let things get out of hand? There are various other related questions as well. It's also worth pointing out though that in statically typed languages, Type inferences at work whether or not you're using it to infer the types of your variables or your functions. So as a quick example here, let's imagine this statement. This could be either string or int. And this outer expression has to be able to figure out what type is the entire expression as a whole. And then we'll have one of two handle functions being called depending on the static type of this expression because overloading is based on static type in Java, not dynamic run type. So let's see how this works. And we see that the object version of this function got called because string and int, once boxed, can share a common super type of object. Now the type system possibly could have said, aha, at compile time, I determined that this is the only branch that gets executed. So therefore, I'm going to treat this as a string. And the linter here knows that this is the case. But to keep the type system simple in Java as a whole, it doesn't try to do this analysis. And you can argue pros and cons on this. But there might be times when your code is more complicated than just this level, and you know that you can infer more than the type system knows how to infer. In which case, you can say, please stop inferring that type for me and treat it how I want to be treated. And we get the string version called now. Let's look a little bit more at this notion of inference within statements. So for example, in a simplified version of the program we have here with C, we can see we have an explicit type on colors. It's an array of three pointers to const care stars. We also have an int index and a main that returns int. And these are the only three explicit types I give in my program. But I can emit LLVMIR, for example, and see what it looks like deeper down a compiler. And we find here, that when we assign to index, we don't just say zero, we say i32 zero. And if we notice, there's a lot of i32s throughout this code here. And for example, when we call printf, we say the type of our argument is a pointer to i8, and we even give the type of the function itself when we call it. And of course, for fun, we can run this. This is just to point out that you could have a language with more explicit typing for all your expressions, and not just the levels of your variables and function types. So let's look at C++ for a little bit more on type inference. Here I have my initial list, here I have my mutable list, and here I've chosen to use a back inserter to fill them in, and there's my loop. And my initial list is of type initializer list const care star. That's what's inferred. So we can run this. But say for some reason, 
we wanted to initialize it as a vector. Older versions of C++ did not allow you to leave out the type arguments on constructor calls. You have to explicitly say const care star, or if you prefer, std string, in which case you implicitly call the string constructor for each. So before C++17, sometimes you would make helper functions just to be able to infer these types. In this case, I'm calling my to vector function here, and it properly infers that it's a vector of const care star. But starting with C++17, we now get inference on our constructor calls as well. Now beyond local variables, C++ these days also allows you to infer the return types of functions. So here I have my explicit trailing return type of standard vector, but I could instead construct it manually inside of my function and infer the return type, which we see can still infer that we have a vector of const care star. And there are times when your return types are going to be so complicated, it might make sense to leave the types inferred. On the other hand though, you might accidentally expose a type in a public API they haven't thought through carefully, which is why I prefer when I can to always be explicit about the return types of my functions. And in a way, this explicit return type is sort of like the explicit left-hand type of pre-Java 10. So getting back to C++, at C++20, we have additional interesting features. Of course, for many years in C++, we have virtual functions and type inheritance. And I might want to type my local variable for some super type instead of the subtype of an object. But even in terms of static generics, we now have the idea of concepts. And in C++20, the iterator header also includes standard definitions for things like output iterators although it's not inside of MSVC's library at the moment. If I want to, I can compile this as C++20. Instead of treating this as a back inserter, I can explicitly put the constraint on it of being an output iterator. Let's take a look at Rust. Here I have my initial immutable list. Here I have my second list that is mutable. I add the colors from the first list and I print them out. And note here, I don't say the type of my second vec but it's known to be a vec of reference to stir. If we run this, it runs fine. So the question is, how does it do this? And the answer is that for local variables in Rust, the inference goes beyond just the initial assignment and includes all uses of it throughout the function. So right here, when I extend it with a vec of reference to stir, it automatically gets inferred that colors2 is also a vec of reference to stir. And there's this great website called typingishard with hyphens .ch where you can read all about cool things like soundness, decidability, Hindley Milner's algorithm W, and system F and more. And we can see, for example, things like how Java is still an undecidable type system because of the generics, even though they didn't infer things like my string int combo. There's also the recent fun discovery that Swift type checking has become undecidable. We're not gonna dig into Swift today, but all these things are examples of how if you don't design your type system carefully, you might have unintended consequences. And when it comes to the somewhat more freeform type inference for local variables in Rust, it might be worth looking a little bit at how type inference works in a variety of languages, including Haskell here. So they're showing, for example, how by the way you write your program, it infers a set of constraints, and then you do constraint solving. Sort of like how in algebra you have a system of equations where you have n equations and n unknowns, and you solve for the values of your unknown variables. If you have an over-constrained system, you might have type errors if types don't agree with each other. But as long as you have enough constraints to determine the types of your variables, and there aren't any errors, you can work it out. Now interestingly, even though Rust allows rather freeform type inference for variables inside of functions, it does not have type inference for return types. So for example here, we can make a rather useless to uppercase function, just to demonstrate a point. And now we have our uppercase colors. The point being here is that I can't just remove my return type and have it be happy with me. This was an explicit decision on the part of the Rust language designers. From my own perspective, as I mentioned, I like to be explicit about the types of my functions, especially if they're gonna be exposed in an API. Maybe if they're private to a limited scope, I might care less. In terms of languages that have different views on this perspective, I think Crystal is very interesting. Crystal is a language that's designed to look and feel like Ruby, but has static typing, ahead of time compilation, and hopefully therefore runs much faster, among other possible benefits. So here's my initial list 
my second list, and my loop. If we run this, we get what we expect. Note that even though I don't have to declare my variables, nor say what the types are, I do have to be explicit about the type of my list here. Because just like C++ or Java, it can't infer the type if I don't give it explicitly on an empty list. And unlike what we saw in Rust, I have to say the type. Now for my functions, I often don't have to explicitly say the type of my arguments or return types. As long as my argument has an upcase method on it, this upcase function will work. And any unique use of this function gets instantiated at compile time. So I can say upcase here and get my color names capitalized, even though I gave no explicit parameter or return types for my function. However, along the way in the design of Crystal, they made requirements for certain things to have explicit types, and that is class and instance variables. So for example, let's use this palette class here and replace my use here with palette colors. If I try running this, I get an error that says I haven't been explicit about the type of colors for the instance variable inside of my class. This works because it can infer an int, but this doesn't. And again, they cite, as the code base grows, understanding a project becomes harder and compile times become very slow. So we have to be explicit about the type of our instance variable. And now Crystal is happy again. That was a decision they made along the way for their type system. There are languages that let you do a little more freeform type inference across all programs. So we can take a look here at Haskell, for example. Here's the list of red, yellow, and blue. I don't bother to make a second list to copy since Haskell really isn't friendly with mutation anyway. And here I'm going to enumerate my colors where I've defined an enumerate function that acts a lot like in Python. So I get zero, red, one, yellow, two, blue. Then I define a show color function which will format my string. I map my indexed colors through show color, and then I print each string out. And I've not defined the type of main, nor the type of enumerate. I only have things in comments at the moment. If we run this, we see it does what we expect. So the inferred type of enumerate here is a list of whatever item happens to be to a list of tuples or pairs of int and item. For lowercase types in Haskell are type variables, or generic types. And even literals themselves are generic sometimes. So for example, zero in Haskell might not always be an int. It could be some kind of floating point type, for example. So if I leave out the explicit type of int on that and try running my program, I see it complains. It could have been an integer, a care, a double. It's not sure where to go with that. It's trying to solve a constraint without sufficient information. Where the new type of my function is not just any type of item, but also a variety of types of index, as long as they conform to these type classes, which are somewhat like traits in Rust or concepts in C++20. So if I want enumerate to be generic, I have to be explicit about what type I need in the end. So I can say my index colors need to be a list of pairs of int and string, at which point Haskell is happy with me again. Also for my local variables in Haskell, it much prefers for me to have them on my expressions rather than on the names of my things. So default here, I can't actually say that index colors is of this type unless I enable the scoped type variables extension. Before we're done, let's take a quick look at PureScript as well. PureScript is sort of a dialect of Haskell that compiled to JavaScript However, a lot of the details of things are quite different. So the solution I found for my example here involved using this fourth index function where I pass my colors through to get an index and color out. Then I chose to concatenate these together and log them out. And again, it works as we expect. But one of the interesting things about PureScript is that the designers thought you should be explicit about your function types. So if I take out the type of main, I get a warning here that says, it is good practice to provide type declarations as a form of documentation. Jing goes back to this question of, what's your comfort level for how much inference at which points in your program? Anyway, I hope this has been fun. and Maybe we can dig deeper into type inference in the future. If you liked the video, be sure to subscribe. Bye y'all.